This is my physics-based vehicle simulator. I made a few videos about it, which you should totally check out, but I've never really shown you the code behind it. That changes today. I've now put the project on GitHub, including new features such as SAS, which is Stability Assist. The reason as to why I haven't done this before is that my code structure was, pretty frankly, awful. However, I have now, with the help of my friend Val, reworked almost everything from the aerodynamics to the controls. After watching this video, you'll hopefully understand the inner workings of the project, as well as the basic physics behind lift and drag. My name is Simon Holmquist, and let's get right into programming projects 2.3. To start off, I'm going to try and explain how I calculate the aerodynamic forces. I won't show any code in this section, but you skip to this timestamp if you want to see my implementation. Okay, so this is an airfoil. It represents the cross section of a wing. It is specifically designed to generate lift, which, along with the drag, composes the combined aerodynamic force. When air comes in from the left, it splits right here at the so-called stagnation point. The air above gets moved along the top of the airfoil and accelerates downwards. It continues downwards even after passing the back edge of the airfoil, angling the airfoil under the airfoil down too. The reaction force that is created from this acceleration, according to Newton's third law, is what we call lift. The pressure difference between the bottom and top of the airfoil are also part of the explanation, but that's a bit out of the scope of this video. The lift force changes in magnitude partially based on something called the angle of attack. The angle of attack is the angle between an airfoil's forward direction and the relative velocity between it and the air. If there's no wind, this relative velocity is the same as the airfoil's velocity. If you set the angle to something like 10 degrees, the downward acceleration of the airflow will increase. A similar effect can be achieved using the flaps at the end of the wing. Here's the equation that I used to calculate the lift. CL is the lift coefficient. The scalar of the change is mainly based on the angle of attack. It is usually determined experimentally, but the data can be stored in and then sampled from what's known as a lift curve. If we have a curve like this, and we know the angle of attack to be 15, we can see that the lift coefficient is 1.5. You may also notice that after that point, the lift coefficient decreases. This is due to the airflow separating from the top of the airfoil and no longer being accelerated downwards, which means no lift. Well, at least for the top of the airfoil. There's still some lift being generated at the bottom of the airfoil, so the airplane doesn't just fall down. What I've described is the phenomenon known as stall. Even in real life, it can lead to stability issues and sometimes even crashes. But there's no reason to worry when flying on a typical commercial jet. Unless the pilot starts doing loops and stuff, in which case stalling is the least of your problems. Anyway, the next part of the lift equation, half of the density times the velocity squared, is simply the dynamic pressure. The dynamic pressure is a measurement of the air's kinetic energy per unit volume. The more kinetic energy the air has, the more lift force it can generate. This energy usually comes in the form of relative speed created by the airplane's engines, but it can also be from wind, although I've not implemented that into my game. The last part of the lift equation is the capital A for area. The larger the top area of the airfoil, the more air is accelerated. You might think that the lift force always acts straight up from the wing, but that's not always the case. It actually acts perpendicular to both the wing's lateral direction, that is its side direction, 
and the relative velocity of the wing through the air. The drag equation is essentially identical to the lift equation, with the main difference being the use of drag coefficient instead of a lift coefficient. The drag coefficient is also determined experimentally and stored in a curve called a drag curve. However, the direction of the drag force is simply opposite the wing's relative velocity. And that should make sense, considering that the drag is basically air resistance, slowing down everything that it touches. Okay, now that you know the physics, let's take a look at the code. I could talk about the code for ages, but in an effort to make this video a sensible length, <laughs> I've decided to focus on the controls, the aerodynamics, and some basic structural decisions I made. With that being said, why not start in the vehicle script? It can be described as the main script that everything connects to. When the game starts, the awake method is called, and a bunch of values are found and stored in the corresponding variables. Although the vehicle script wants to grab a reference to the player from the game manager, you don't actually have to worry about adding a player if you just want to fly around and have some fun. Just assign any old game object to the player's controller spot right here, and you should be good to go. The next Unity function to execute is the update function which, of course, is called once every frame. And we find some code to calculate the correct mass, but most importantly, I call the update control method from the vehicle control component. Vehicle control is responsible for the intentional movement of the vehicle, including SAS. At the bottom of the update control function, we find two method calls, one to try gimbal all engines we want to try move all movable structures. The gimbal code is still a bit dirty, so let's look at try move all movable structures. When the method is called, it finds all the movable parts connected to the vehicle, and then calls their try move method. It needs info about the SAS, as well as some user input. When the try move method finally executes, begins by calling another method called update angle manual with the key press array as a parameter. This method changes the private angle variable depending on user input. If the first key is pressed, the angle increases, and if the second key is pressed, the angle decreases. The maximum angle is determined by the rotation limit variable, but I also apply some dampening. I do this to smooth out of flight at high speeds. The faster the airplane moves, the more lift its control surfaces generate, and thus the maneuvers become more drastic. Here's a formula for calculating the dampening. If we were to plot the damping on the y-axis and the speed on the x-axis, the graph will look like this. As the speed increases, the angle gets more and more limited, but the curve's rate of change gets slower and lower. Although this does a good job of handling the manual input, we also want to automatically stabilize the vehicle with SAS. If we go back to the try move function for a second, we can see that we have a call to another function, again called update angle SAS right here, taking the SAS strength as a parameter. It gets called if SAS is enabled and none of the keys are pressed. Jumping into that function, we find some similarities to the update angle manual function such as the speed dampening and the angle clamping, but we also find a whole lot of new stuff. Right here, for example, I calculate what drag and lift forces that the structure would generate at its maximum angle of attack. If we add those forces together, we get the combined aerodynamic force, with which we can calculate the torque that the park would create. To do that, I use this simple formula. The funny looking T is called tau, and represents the torque. The R is the vector from the center of rotation to where the force, F, is applied. Speaking of which, the force in this case is the aerodynamic force vector. We also need a measurement of the entire vehicle's current rotational speed. To do that, I fetch angular velocity from the vehicle's rigid body. Angular velocity is to torque what normal velocity is to normal force, for lack of a better word. <laughs> 
I then convert this angular velocity to local space, which means that the x, y, and z axis of the velocity correspond to pitch, yaw, and roll. After that, I choose which axis I want the part to impact. For example, ailerons impact the roll, while elevators impact the pitch. Now that I know the amount of underside spin on the axis that I care about, I want to see how big of an impact my part would actually have. To do this, I measure to which extent the predicted torque acts in the desired direction using vector 3 dot dot. If the two vectors point in the same direction, the dot product returns positive 1, and if they point in opposite directions, it returns negative 1. Combining all these calculations, I get an error. My goal is to reduce this error to zero, and to do that, I use a PID controller. PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative, the three methods that it uses to correct the error. It is often called KP, KI, and KD. KP is case for overall strength of the controller, KI ups the strength the longer the error persists, and KD scales the output based on how fast the error changes, effectively smoothing out the movement. The values for these vary greatly depending on the vehicle in question, so it requires some tinkering to find the values that suit your needs. Using all these methods, the PID controller tries to stabilize the vehicle by angling the controller surfaces so that they can create torque opposite the current spin. Val is way more knowledgeable on this than I am, but I'm planning on learning more in the future. The controller returns a number that I clamp between minus 1 and 1 to then use as a coefficient for how fast to turn the movable structure. The direction of rotation is simply based on if the angle is negative or not. I finally clamp the angle so that it never goes beyond its limits. That's basically everything regarding the controls, so let's move on to the aerodynamics. The code for the aerodynamics is contained in a class that has the innovative name Aerodynamics. I created an instance of it right here in the Team Movable Structure script, as well as in the T-Structural Part script. This kind of compartmentalization is often called composition. It's good practice to have each class be responsible for one thing only, and composition is a great way to link specialized classes to a root class, so to speak. Anyway, the aerodynamics class has a method called execute aerodynamic forces. It makes sure that all forces are compiled correctly and applied to the rigid body. The weird thing is the unity tries to do its physics stuff on an interval that is way too too slow. I want it to be more frequent so that my physics calculations can be more accurate. To do this, I have to simulate a sort of physics substep. I got this idea from this video made by a guy who calls himself Gas Giant or GitHub. Go check it out, it's amazing, check out its repo too, I have linked it both in the description and in my repo too, since I use some of his code. What it does is basically simulate the aerodynamics, or the forces, half a frame into the future and then combine it with the aerodynamics in the current frame. It's very fancy, but it basically simulates another physics calculation step. Very useful, helped me a lot, remove a lot of jitter in the plane's movement. Other than that, I calculate the lift and drag forces basically the same way as I did in the update angle SES function, with the main difference being that now I use the actual angle of the control surface instead of just its most effective angle. This is still very abstract, so let's dive into the actual force calculations. Get lift vector does exactly what it says it does. It gives you the lift vector. To do that, it first needs to calculate the structure's angle of attack. That calculation has its own method. Get AOA. Taking the part's angle, which is not the same as angle of attack, and velocity as input. Let's take a look at how it works. I first convert the velocity to the vehicle's local space and store it in a variable called velocity vehicle space. 
its along with other variable names in this function are a bit long, but I think it's necessary to understand the code. Now I need to project the velocity vector onto a 2D plane which cuts right through the airfoil. This is done because my lift curve only accounts for airflow on this plane. If I were to calculate sideways airflow too, my computer would explode. In order to project the velocity, I need the direction perpendicular to the plane. This is just the part's lateral direction in vehicle space. The actual projection is done using this neat trick with a dot product. Remember in school when you were taught to draw a vector using two component vectors? Well, I basically subtract the velocity vector's component in the direction of the part's lateral direction. Hopefully, that makes it clear enough. Next thing we need is the part's forward direction, in vehicle space, which I get very similarly to how I got the lateral direction. However, now I also pitch the vector by the part's angle. Now that we have both the flattened velocity, or the projected velocity depending on the term you like to use, and the forward direction, we can finally calculate the angle between them using vector 3 signed angle. This is our angle of attack or AOA for short. Going back to get lift vector and looking at the next line, we see that we calculate the lift coefficient based on the angle of attack. As previously mentioned, I sample a point from the animation curve like this. I also divide the angle of attack by 1000 so that the curve is a bit easier to handle in the inspector. After that, I'll calculate the magnitude of the lift force using the lift equation. If you want a refresh on that, head back to this timestamp. The last thing I do in the get lift vectors method is to scale a unit vector by the lift force. This vector points in the direction of lift, which, as I previously mentioned, is perpendicular to both the velocity and the forward direction. That's all for the lift force! Now, I'll go over the much simpler drag force. The drag is calculated in a method called get drag vector. So let's take a look at it. It is very similar to get lift vector, but with a few key differences. First of all, I of course use the drag coefficient instead of the lift coefficient, which I acquire using the drag curve. Secondly, the direction of the drag force simply upset the velocity. That's all, really. Now you know how I calculate the aerodynamic forces. Lastly, I'll cover how I structure the different classes for the parts. I'd very much like some feedback on this, since I'm pretty new to designing code structures. Every part is in some way related to the vehicle part class. It is an abstract class that contains the most fundamental of the parts functionalities. The classes that inherit from it include T-structural part, T movable structure, T engine, and many more to come. The T at the beginning of the names signify that they are template classes. I don't know if this is an established coding convention, but I find it handy so that I never confuse a category with a unique part. These template classes contain properties that are shared between all parts of the specific type. For example, every movable structure needs to move and every engine needs to ignite. These also contain the configs with the specific stats for the parts. The last classes in the chain inherit from the template classes, and they are classes specific to a certain part, such as cockpit or the R25. These classes are not abstract. Many of them are empty, but you can add unique functionality there if you'd like. That's about it. I hope you've got an idea of how this whole thing works now. A huge thank you goes out to Val for helping me with the PID. He has some good content on his channel and you should totally check it out. The link is in the description. As previously mentioned, the code is available on GitHub and the link to that is also in the description. Feel free to use any part of the code you'd like, but I'd appreciate it if you gave me and Val credit in some way. It isn't a finished product and will be improved in the future, so why not hit that subscribe button so you'll know when there's an update. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and comment if you have anything that you want to say or ask. Anyhow, I wish you all a great day. Bye.